Amazing. Thanks for those little thumbs up as well for the recording. Uh, amazing. So, yeah, so this session is a workshop just, or it's a conversation really, about looking at how it is we can come together, you know, and, and live together, work together, how we collaborate well, especially from the perspective of perhaps starting eco-villages and communities and such. So if anyone would like to, just to help frame things for me, is really just to, yeah, let me know why you're here. What is it that attracted you to this session, this event? You could either put it in the chat or unmute yourself if you're okay to be on recording. And yeah, and just just let me know, why why are you here? What's um, What would be useful in this hour and a half? for me to kind of cover so are you looking to start a community are you in a community or yeah just give me some some framework around which to to build diego i see you've unmuted yourself is it something you'd like to say yeah thank you um good morning or good afternoon or whatever everyone um um it's i'm in oaxaca mexico so um it's with we're going through a very strong gentrification process in Oaxaca and we've had lately the idea of maybe um, joining forces and resources to have some kind of shared um, living space. Um, we've talked about it Briefly, and uh, many of the people in the in the team, I run a uh, nonprofit that works with potters, and uh, not everyone is so excited, so excited to spend so their nights with the people that they're working <laughs> with in the mornings. So yeah, I was just I'm curious about um, what you all have to offer from that perspective. Lovely. And where are you based? Which part of the world? It's this is Oaxaca, Mexico. The south. Wow. It's the south of Mexico. Okay. Amazing. 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 Great. Thank you very much for joining us. Anyone else? So, how to start a community when people are maybe not necessarily even so interested in starting community? <laughs> Anything else? Anyone else? I can go. <clears throat> my, name is, my name is Yuli. Uh, I um, uh, come from down under, as in the land the British have called Australia. Uh, but I'm spending some time in a community in New York. And I study the social practices that the healthy practices that allow us to show up well for each other in communities and I look at what stops us showing up well for each other so I'm very interested to hear from other people and really look forward to uh, looking at the differences in our communities of what we can make work and what are the common challenges and what we do about them. And I'm really grateful that you've put this together. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. What you'll find with my, I tend not to teach people. I tend to um, encourage people to work things out for themselves. So I'll be asking a lot of questions and it sounds like you've been thinking about this very well and probably have some really amazing practices already. So it'd be really, really, really amazing to to tap into some of your knowledge as well, because as far as I'm concerned, I'm here to facilitate learning. I'm not here as the person who knows everything and um, is going to just tell you how to do things. It's about us coming together to work things out ourselves. Beautiful. I, could I just ask you what your name is? Sure. Um, yeah, and I should change my name. I was just about to say everyone to everyone. Um, if you can change your name and perhaps where you're from and perhaps if you have uh, particular pronouns that you would prefer for us to use, if you could change your, um, yeah, your Zoom profile, 
and say I'm using someone else's account, so I haven't changed my name. Uh, I should do that in myself. So my name is Rakesh. Uh, oops. And I'm on a European laptop, so everything's in the right different places to what I'm used to. Um, and I'm currently, finally, in London. Oops, that's not how you spell London. There you go. Cool. Anyone else like to share before we get cracking? Yeah, uh, Slava. Ah, and then Vishva. Okay, I'm new. Hi, hello. Uh, I, yeah, my name is Slava Shekhar, and I'm uh, attending this meeting very randomly. Somebody, one of the people in my community just shared the link with me. Uh, I'm calling from Ontario, Canada. I live in the bush. Um, we have a beautiful land-based project that we started with a group of people uh, about five years ago. We're slowly growing and learning, uh, learning and revisiting our agreements, communal agreements, revisiting how we are in a relationship with the land and um, yeah, cultivating all the juicy parts we're learning together. And it's, it's quite uh, interesting and quite uh, challenging to work through things, not just with humans, but also with nature, because nature dictates how things are as well. And it's funny, Jewel, you said down under. I have we have a place here we call down under, which is like really deep in the woods because we acre uh, we steward uh, uh, pretty big piece of land and learning how to do that. Great. So my background is in permaculture, so taking care of land and land stewardship is actually my my primary focus, and actually looking after land and working with land and animals and insects so much easier than people. So uh amazing. So, There's my my landmate just joined in. The one Rihanna is here too. Hey Rihanna. Thanks okay. for sharing the link with me and inviting me. Anyway, okay, so anyway. last one, I believe Vishva uh wanted to say something and then we all will get cracking. So Vishva. So I have a mighty dream. I have a dream to tend to the change that needs to be changed. I, to tend to change in a way that when we come out the other side of the climate collapse, we don't create more problems. So the assumption is this, that we are coming out of it. And that we need to be cautious enough right now to not recreate what is on this side of the chasm. And yeah. I've, been, I've been part of a lot of online communities. And I'm also weaving my family together because it's fragmented into nuclear households. So it's, I don't, I, I don't have an, I have a aspiration for eco ability, but I cannot leave my family behind or, and I have to make it global at the same time. So I am in that of doing it all at once okay brilliant okay so thank you very much vishva and everyone else so um i'll give you a kind of quick background into to why and how i've ended up doing this kind of work and then we'll as I say get cracking really looking at what what are the challenges really of living in community and you know what are the obstacles and what are some of the solutions as to how we get there and um so my background is I grew up in, in London, you in know, a very poor family. So we had to work out how to make ends meet. So we would grow our own food. We'd build our own furniture. We'd make our own clothing. When things break, we'd work out how to fix it. Uh, we'd make our own medicines. And so for me growing up, this was just everyday life. This is, there was nothing uh, revolutionary, nothing, um, yeah, nothing, nothing really, you know, I mean, nothing was insurmountable. We figured everything out ourselves. Um, 
as I started to becoming more aware of the world, I realized how, you know, I mean, the way I saw the world, how beautiful it is, you know, with nature and how how things could be so amazing and beautiful. And yet what I noticed is how uh, people uh, and we, we can break down how and why this happens really in a situation where they're they're more or less they're exploiting each other. They're exploiting the land. They're um you know, greedy, selfish. And I was looking at all the, you know, the corporations and the governments and how, you know, um, and I, I was just so angry. You know, how is it you, why is it that you're behaving this way? Can't you see what you're doing to the world? And it really used to frustrate me. And so as I was growing up, I became an activist and, um, you know, was shouting and screaming about almost everything, almost, um, you know, the British government, the Shell and uh, McDonald's and British Petroleum and, you know, uh, Nestle and Cadbury's and Coca-Cola and shouting and screaming and demonstrating and getting into fights and, you know, with the police and whoever else and, uh, and just really putting it out there. And it took me a while before I realized that uh, this anger that I had inside of me, this rage that I had actually came from love. It actually came because I really loved this planet. I could see how beautiful every insect, animal, and uh, plant and you know even human beings were and but I saw so many things so many people so much that was completely working against that and this is where my anger came from so I then learned how is it that instead of reacting with rage and anger how is it I turn that into positive so what I also noticed is that a lot of what I was doing was defining myself by what I was against I was against this, I was against that, I was against everything, but what, and so I knew what was wrong with the world, and I knew what other people should be doing, but actually, what was I doing right? What, you know, I could see clearly what the governments and the corporations were doing, but what was I actually, who, what, who am I? What was I doing that was actually making the world a better place? And so this was my starting point. And I studied all kinds of things from, um, you know, yoga, meditation, massage and various things until eventually I came to homeopathy. I became a qualified homeopath, started doing disaster relief work as a homeopath. And um, then eventually, um, cut a long story short, met someone um, in Croatia who wouldn't allow me to go to all these dangerous war zones and cyclones and earthquakes and what have you so I just, she kind of wanted me to settle down uh, which was quite scary and um, so we, we bought some land in Croatia tried to start an eco village said yeah let's build a house let's grow our own food all this stuff is easy and sure enough you know buying the land was easy growing the food was easy building the houses was easy working out how to make electricity was easy financing it was easy but while it was just a couple of us meaning myself and another local uh, person who we worked um, together to, to create this eco village along with our partners uh, while it was just two families and we both shared a really common vision it was easy but as soon as person three four five came in all of a sudden we realized we didn't have the tools in fact we knew it because when we created the the vision we, we basically, when we said, hey, let, we should work together, let's create an eco village together. We went off and looked at um, all the things we wanted to do and created a mind map. So all the things we wanted to do, how we wanted to do it, we mapped it all out. And then we came back and it was absolutely identical. It was like, wow, perfect. Uh, as I say, growing food, making houses, making electricity, drilling with black water, grey water, financing, all this stuff, easy, 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 easy. But we both really funnily had a black hole in our mind map. There was one area that neither of us knew anything about. And what's even more funny is we both used exactly the same words for it. We both said we know nothing about conflict resolution. We knew nothing about, you know, we, we didn't even have the term 
uh, collaborative working or, you know, community. We didn't even have that terminology in our vocabulary. It was just, we knew when people came together, they would fight, they would argue, and it would be chaos. And um, so we started to to really explore how is it that we could go, you know, in while we were doing this, we learned permaculture and, you know, uh and which to be honest for me was just second nature anyway there was nothing actually on the permaculture course that i didn't really already know to the point where the students said they learned as much from me as the teacher and the teacher came to me and said wow you should be teaching this you know more than most of the teachers i know because for me it's just common sense you know working with the land and seeing how land and animals and insects and everything um because I, I i actually didn't go to school I pretended to go to school. I'd go to school, I'd go in the morning, I'd get my mark. And then as soon as I could, I'd run out of school, go and wait in a park until the truant officers would go by. And then I would go home. And then I'd do exactly the same after lunch again. And so most of the time I just spent in the in the park, watching the world go by, observing nature. So I really didn't get schooled in the classic way, which actually was hugely to my advantage. Um. But to kind of, yeah, cut this long story short, um, what we I say, all these practical things were really easy for us. But people, dealing with people was really complex. So once I'd studied permaculture and had a framework to express all the things that were for me were just common sense, um, you know, and, and even within permaculture, what I noticed is how many people became really great at understanding the relationship between animals and insects and water and wind and, you know, all the natural resources and how we can co-create an environment where everything takes care of itself. But that same level of detail of taking care of each other, other human beings was massively missing and so even within a lot of the permaculture projects as I say they were really great at, at, at working with nature but they wouldn't put that same love and energy and tension into working with each other so uh cut a long story short i ended up um leaving croatia coming back to england uh, at that time which was about i don't know 15 20 years ago i found um the transition movement was just starting. So I jumped in with them and said, hey, I can offer you my food growing skills. But in exchange, what I really want to know is about how people can work well together. I want to know about, uh, yeah, collaborative working. As I say, I didn't have the terminology. I just knew that I needed conflict resolution and I need needed something. And they kept sharing various things with me at this time. Dragon Dreaming was just uh, was just starting, and I met John um, John Croft uh, at a conference, and uh, and that sounded fantastic. And we started to try and using it, and bits of it worked, but bits of it didn't. And then everyone kept telling me about sociocracy. I was like, okay, great, wow, what, yeah. And they were like, oh my god, you've got to see this. It's incredible. It's oh, wow, all okay. Tell me, tell me, tell me. And he's like, blah, 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 blah. what? Oh, yeah, well, it's going to change the world. OK. And they would use such big, huge, complicated words. And it made it so abstract that I was like, I can see you're excited, but I haven't a clue what the hell you're on about. I don't even know what this tool is supposed to do, uh, let alone how it works. And it took me a long time. I was actually running an eco village design education course in Denmark and we invited someone to come and teach about sociocracy and in 10 minutes in a break before he started his session I just said dude what is sociocracy I keep hearing about this but uh everyone just keeps talking no I don't get it oh no I have no idea what actually is it and in 10 minutes he explained something to me so beautifully in plain simple English and he said when people come together they assume that everyone else who is there in that room in that project doing whatever it is you're doing together 
is doing it for the same reason. But that's not necessarily the case. And so when it comes to making a decision, we make a decision based on what we want our end goal to be. What character, what culture, what, you know, so all the different things that define us and how we make decisions, we make decisions based on that. And if they're not the same, this is where tension kicks in. So all sociocracy is, is a tool set that helps us to be really clear that when we're together in this constellation, this is what we want to achieve while we are together. And this is how we want to achieve it. So when we then make decisions, we make decisions based against, does it help us to reach this? Or does it take us away from where we all collectively want to go to? So now all of a sudden you make decisions based on logic, based on a clear goal. So this brings us to the first point of, um, if we look at uh, community working, and uh, co-living etc etc uh, what we notice is most projects fail to even get started because the vision wasn't clear enough and so people uh, get attracted to a vision um, based on what they think the vision actually is but if it's not shared clearly then there's already a mismatch and with that mismatch, uh, people assume, well, clearly everyone else is like me because they're also interested in the same project, like an eco village. So, all right, let's, um, yeah. So, so, yeah. So when you start, um, so you come together, imagining that you're all the same. But when it, as I say, you come to start making decisions, all of a sudden it starts getting really. Well, why are you trying to take us there when clearly we all want to go here? And um, and so without a clear vision, projects really struggle to get off the ground. Um, in fact, maybe, yeah, maybe forgot before we go too deeply into looking at tools and things. Um, what do you, yeah, when it comes to actually making decisions, having meetings to try and decide things, what are some of the most stressful things what are the things that you know sometimes when you go to uh, someone invites you to a meeting you're like oh do I really have to go to that one you know because it's like oh you know it's gonna be whatever it's gonna be not so enriching so what are some let's 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 see and you can type it into the chat or if it's really quick you can unmute and just say it out loud but let's just ping a few ideas what are so, some of those things that really frustrate you about having to make decisions i say either in the chat or um or share it out loud but yeah let's keep it nice and short and brief and then we can so very different human characters that you have to deal with so different characteristics yeah too many options too many possibilities i'm a gemini and so there are so many possibilities and there's so many ways of doing things. I get that one. Uh, lots of people struggle to know what they want and then to express them. Brilliant. The fear of being wrong in the future and not having an option to go back. Good one. Yes and no questions and answers. Not enough shared information to make the decision. Um, yeah, the information is perhaps held with a few. No clear goals. Da, 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 coming back to uh, sorry go on in myself once again and not being understood <laughs> okay so repeating yourself because yeah you're feeling people are not hearing you so these are really co uh, really common so one more often a dynamic sets in where people seem to just want to say what they want to say and it's not a real listening and responding just lots of people airing their thoughts without common direction. Ooh, yes, indeed. So no conscious listening. Yeah, a really big one there. Um, so we can add a few other things to that. Uh, so no clear agenda, no clear timetable, people not sticking to a timetable, not sticking to the agenda. 
uh, we can add people taking um, too much space. Uh, it's kind of said in, in one way that, you know, some people say just way too much, which might not necessarily even help to to evolve the actual conversation or discussion, but just airing themselves and probably even people speaking before people have even finished talking. So assuming they know what you're going to say, and this leaves people feeling, well, you haven't even heard me. You don't even I haven't even got to the point where I'm asking a question yet and you're already answering it. Uh, you haven't actually heard me. And, um, you know, so in many groups, some some people are, say take too much space. Others take no space at all and don't even respond and don't participate. And what we find quite often with the people who are quieter in a group, uh, quite often they're more thoughtful. They're taking the time to think and understand and uh, hmm. And deliberating before they express themselves whereas people who express themselves immediately not always but quite often can be very yeah dominant and, and maybe not necessarily think things through they're, they're they quite often can be quite egotistical and it's more about expressing them you know being heard and being seen to be heard than actually offering anything really sincere and really um you know really I'd say something that really helps a group to really move forward so brilliant so yes yeah, so the last few that have just jumped in making decisions too quickly reactive not proactive beautiful um so we all recognize some of these challenges and obviously living together adds a huge 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 amount of extra dynamics as well um Okay, so let's let's start breaking some of this down. Um, as I say, regardless of what we're doing, whether it's living together or whether it's working on a project together, if we don't have a clear vision of what we want to achieve uh, and how we want to achieve it, as I say, quite often when it comes to solving problems, we're all solving a very different problem. Uh, an easy way for me to explain this when I teach sociocracy is uh if you imagine imagine i say hey let, let's yeah let's go out for a meal yeah let, let's go to that place we went to last time you know i'm a little bit vague and one person remembers something that is um ooh, he was asking me to reboot itself no thank you um so yeah one person remembers ah that place that's just down the road you know it's it's like five minutes walk Someone remembers something in, you know, right in the center of town, which is maybe a bus ride or a bike ride or a, a train ride away. Someone remembers going to a place which is, you know, several cities away. You know, it's a train ride away. It's a long distance away, you know, and, um, you know, maybe two hours by train or something. And and so when it comes to solving the problem, how do we get there? Oh, let's walk. Walk. Walk all the way to no that's no 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 we need to get a train what do you mean get a train why would we bother getting a train we can just cycle there and uh, so everyone is correct in solving the problem the way they see the problem but we haven't defined what the problem is so we're all solving a very 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 different challenge and so we're so it's not that you're, you know, you're crazy. How could you, you know, that's a stupid question, a stupid option. That, you know, why would you do that? No, we need to reframe and understand why someone has offered a solution. They've offered a solution because they genuinely think it's the right thing to do. But as I say, it's not the solution that's the problem. It's the framing of the question that is incomplete. So, um. So it's the same when we start an eco village. You know, uh, if we're starting to live together with all the all the complexities and all the amazing, beautiful things that humans do that either can uh, bring huge amounts of joy or bring huge amounts of tension and stress. Um, you know, it's even more important. So when we start a project or a community, it's really important that we have this common vision of why we want to start it. So, for example, if um, let's say for me, uh, 
an eco village, you know, that I want to live in, you know, the people I want to surround myself with and uh, and be really good friends with and, you know, be family with are people who share some certain common, uh, yeah, common ethics, shall we say. So for me, it would have to be a, a drug free, alcohol free community with um, a vegan or at least vegetarian and uh, and to live in a community where people realize that human beings are all really amazing, incredible, but at some point we will screw up. And how we deal with when we do things wrong, when we do things that create agitation for others, how we deal with it is more important than anything else. To deal with it in a way that is uh, supportive and say, okay, yeah, sorry, my mistake. I see that my actions created tension in you. How can we, yeah, how do we resolve this? How do we make sure that this doesn't happen again? Again, my intention wasn't to upset you. Um, so for me, this is the kind of community I want to be in. But when I put the call out, I say, hey, you know, let's, uh, who wants to be, yeah, there's all this land in Croatia. It's, you know, it's only 500 euros a hectare. We can even get building permission. It's got water on it. It's got, it's great. It's amazing. You know, everyone needs no more than two hectares each. It's going to cost you nothing. You know, come along. Who's interested? And, wow. People come, you know, and everyone's excited. And wow, this is incredible. Beautiful land. Um, and, you know, and then we start to co-create some kind of a vision for what we want to do or start making plans rather for, for what how we're going to build it. So, yeah, so we can all have our own plots of land or we can have something communal and we have maybe one big communal space. And, yeah, what do we want in that communal space? Maybe we've got all our own little huts where we can live in or maybe some people live in a big house all together. And, um, you know, and this is we can have a nice big shared kitchen here. We can have a teaching space over there. We can have a swimming pool or a, a natural pool over that side. And, uh, oh, we, we want to have it for children to come and learn. So we have like an outdoor learnscape over there and da, 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 da. And then we'll put this there. We'll put that there. And, and this is where we we'll put the abattoir. The what? Yeah, yeah. This is where we kill the pigs. Uh... Oh, uh, uh, but but it's an e vegan eco village. Uh, we no no no. You said it's an eco village, and if we're gonna if we're gonna eat and have our own food, then we need to kill the pigs so that we can cook. Yeah, uh, 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 hold on, hold on. Uh, you know the vision wasn't clear, and everyone assumed that you know that everyone else was also vegan. But you know, and um, but you know, unless it's expressed, this isn't necessarily the case. And what we see, and I can tell you, there's a, there was one community, I won't say where it was, but um, they had about 350 people on their mailing list wanting to be part of this community. And, uh, and for about four or five years, they were really struggling to get it off the ground, really. And it was a vegan eco-village, strictly, strictly, strictly vegan eco-village. And so they asked me, can I come and help? So maybe, you know, a good number of people, about 60, 70 people kind of showed up and, you know, to this kind of gathering. And we started talking and, and, and then, you know, during a break where people started sharing food, um, which is part, intentionally, very intentionally part of the pattern. Um, one person said, oh, do you mind if I just put a bit of cheese in that, in that bread? You know, it's like. Just oh, I really, really, really need to eat some cheese. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, would you have some extra? Yeah, oh, I'll have some as well. And uh, and all of a sudden, word kind of got out. And what they realised out of these sixty people who turned up, only two were actually vegan. The majority were not. I mean, some even ate meat, but they were fascinated by this uh, the idea of a community. Uh, the vegan aspect was, well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pretend for a little while until, you know, uh, and so it was, are you surprised? Another community, um, again, for almost 30 years, these people were talking about living together. No lie. 30 years, they were, you know, they were, they were thinking and talking and da, 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 and uh, I'll say which country it was in. It was in the Netherlands. Uh, and um, and 
half and out of I think there was about 10, 12 people there. And half of the people said it has to be wherever we buy land, it has to be here in the Netherlands. And the other half said it can be anywhere, just not the Netherlands. And uh, <laughs> and then they're surprised that they they couldn't figure out how to live together. So uh, we did a three hour session with them to co-create a common vision, which they were really shocked that after three hours, we really did create a communal vision, which they were like, wow, this is incredible. And um, I can't remember how long ago was that. That was maybe six years ago, but three years ago, for sure, 100 percent, it's happened. The, the place has been bought. People are living there. It is happening. So after 30 years of blah, 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 not even being clear, just that one thing of getting clarity, getting that common vision. Obviously, I taught them a lot more sociocracy and all the rest. But just that one thing helped them to come together to then be able to move on. So the vision, really, really, really super important. Um, what would you do, though? If out of, you know, you've got a group of people, let's say 20, 30 of you are all coming together and saying, yeah, yeah, eco vegan, you're vegan, you've all kind of uh, got a kind of, kind of common vision, but there's a few people who, well, I know he's not vegan, uh, I know he also does drugs and smokes as well, but he's got the money. He can, you know, he, he can buy the land for us because we, we don't we don't really have it. And uh, where do you think that's going to end? Allowing people in who don't really share your vision. <laughs> Quite a few thumbs down. Exactly. We call it a time bomb. It's a time bomb. It's ticking away. It's ticking away. It's ticking away. Ticking away. Boom. One day it will explode and it will destroy your project. Having that sincerity, that authenticity is really important. It's really essential. So um, there are lots of different strategies, lots of different ways in which you can, um, you know, uh, yeah, you can organize the finances. Maybe we can look at that a little bit later, uh, especially for people, you know, because Quite often what we find is some people have a lot of money. Some people don't have much. So how do you deal with that? And I see Diego has, has a hand up. Go for it. Ask, ask away. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm wondering, and maybe you talk about this later, like what is the space for, um, it's not the right word, dissent, but like, uh, you know, it seems like everybody needs to be agreeing totally in everything so then what if if there's some differences in vision beautiful to be there because that enriches the the process right and this is exactly where i was about to go to so brilliant well done um so what would you do is if you for example you can't you, you know you, you had these 20 30 people and you all you kind of you know say yeah uh, um you've got a, a common vision and um and yet then all of a sudden you realize, yeah, there are some people who really are very strictly vegan, very strictly, you know, share that common vision. But there are others who are kind of outside of that, who are not really aligned to that. So the way that I work is I then say, well, OK, well, can we compartmentalize the project? So, for example, uh could we, for example, have um, one community, you know, so maybe one common house that is strictly vegan and another house, which is on the other, you know, which is nearby. We're all friends. We're all helping each other. But that house is not. And that house is is for people who, for whatever reason, want to eat meat and want to. You know, can we live side by side? Can we, you know, can we co-create it? And what we have done um is we made a design where it was for a particular spiritual community where the absolute core one section of the the project was for the core people who follow the spiritual practice 
and so people who are really totally 100% in the community, uh, this, you know, following the, the same practices, um, you know, some of whom were, are just living there, just renting a place effectively, some of whom are owning the place and, uh, you know, totally part of the project, own the project. Then there's people who are somehow utilizing their space and love the environment and maybe they're you know maybe there's a school so then maybe there's some of the teachers or maybe there's a food growing project and maybe they're helping with that and so while they're engaged in the in the, the project itself but they're not necessarily so strict with the spiritual practice but they're still part they want to be part of the community so we created another area a whole series of houses and a little community a uh, little micro village within that of people who match that then there's um you know but they still want to be around they still want to live there they but they're not necessarily part of the core and then another area where um you know these are just for casual outsiders people coming and going uh these is you know where we uh, host workshops and this that and the other and various things so in other words we kind of compartmentalized the space and for each group they have very different vision, mission and aims and very different cultural practices of what, um, you know, what, what is permissible, what is not permissible in order to allow the flow and the connectivity and the joy between people to really remain there. So we know exactly what's happening and there's no surprises, etc. So, um, OK, another story that maybe helps to, to explain um yeah what you're saying diego uh, or your question is there's a, a vegan uh, association in a really small country i won't say which uh who they said that every time they meet it's bloodshed the meetings end in disaster people shouting and screaming at each other and really it was they said it was such an awful experience to be part of this vegan association and um you know and everyone's pointing fingers as well it's his fault it's their fault it's them blah, 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 that kind of thing and uh so i said all right i'll facilitate let's see so we organized a, a meetup and we had three hours and you know we were going to have food in the middle but the first hour hardly anyone turned up so those of us who were there we just ate the food thank you very much um and then people started to eventually come in and, you know, so we lost the first hour. Uh, and by the time people arrived, and I think there was about 40 people in total, um, I started by saying, OK, so why are you vegan and why are you part of this vegan association? And so we went around and we heard so many different reasons. And, uh, you know, some are for environmental reasons, some for health reasons, some for out of compassion, uh, you know, some um, some were like really, yeah, these bloody human beings, they're all so evil and they're, you know, animals are the only perfect, you know, and you're a human being. Ah, and so, we, ah. and some were kind of, well, I'm, gee, I'm not even really vegan, uh, but I kind of like the idea of maybe being vegan. And so, um, so as the, you know, as, as it kind of evolved and we started hearing, um, uh, you know, what was going on, what, what we found out is quite often the, the kind of vegan activist would, would come along and say, right, you know, they're doing this at the zoo and we must go there and get prepared. We need to chain ourselves and glue ourselves to the other and get ready to be beaten by the police. And this is really, really, really important. And wh why aren't you with me? What's wrong with you people? You say you're vegan. You're not real vegans. You're la, 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 la. And the one who's, but well, I'm not even vegan. Um, I, 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 I don't want to be beaten up by the police. Um, you know, and it's kind of like, okay, so it's really clear and really obvious as to, as to, you know, why there's this tension in the room. So what we did is we said, okay, we, we recognize that it's really beautiful, that there's so many different people with so many different reasons for being here. Uh, and we want to take care of you all. So we co-create, we co-created a vision. What is the 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 kind of the, the the one thing that unifies us all, you know? And and that vision basically was all about love and compassion for all 
life. So animals, insects, plants, planet Earth, human beings, this whole existence is just compassion. So that was the core. And uh, but then within the project, there were people who were interested in ecology. There were those who were interested in the health and well-being, you know, the, the health side of vegan, those who are interested in, um, you know, in being activists and stopping people who were uh, who they deemed were, were you know, were abusing animals, etc., etc. And so we created little subgroups. So regardless of where you, um, you know, so, so basically when you're together, what we agreed is when they're together as the big group, this is the vision. This is the common vision, this compassion. So you talk from the perspective of that. But then those who want to go and do the activism, this is your circle. You go and work in that realm and you support each other. And if you've got anything to feed back to us, you come back and in the big group meeting, you just tell us, by the way, next Sunday, we're going to the zoo. We're going to do this action. Um, anyone who wants to join us, come and talk to me. Uh, and so on and so forth. So all the different groups, they now have a place where they can share information, but they do it according to, you know, their specialist areas. They do the, they, they collect people, uh, they, they have meetings and organizations and, you know, do stuff in their own little groups. But then the central point is just where that information is shared. It isn't where it gets discussed. It isn't where it gets, um, you know, um, yeah, where you spend too much time discussing things. So we can bring all these different ideas, all these different passions. Uh, but the key thing is we still need a common vision. But as I say, sometimes that common vision, uh, there, there's certain things about what really is core to certain people that may not necessarily, uh, that may contradict each other. So for some people, for me personally, you know, I, I really believe in a world where, where we can show compassion towards each other and animals and so on and so forth. So for me, this is really uh, a really powerful, a really important thing for me. And so for me to uh, be part of a community where people are regularly abusing animals and so on and so forth is quite, um, it will upset me. And so my heart won't be singing and my heart won't be singing. And if my heart's not singing, I won't be giving my all to a project. So some things we really do need to see how it is that we can, you know, separate them and compartmentalize them and take care of them. You know, we can support them in their their world in whatever way they want it. But uh, it's not who I want to surround myself with. So sometimes we do need to do that. All right. So common vision, really, really, really essential. Um, once we've gotten past that, uh, what's really important is then we have a culture and uh, and that culture is it's not just about having the common vision. It's about now about making sure that when we do things together, we have a common kind of culture as to how we do it. So that culture could include that we listen to each other. We allow each other to express to you know to finish and complete and express ourselves before we interrupt uh you know part of the culture could be around making sure that everyone has an equal amount of time to express themselves and no one person spends more time than the other uh you know doesn't take over in other words so there's all kinds of things but also equally there's a lot of tools that can help us to do this so for me, sociocracy is my number one tool because, uh, and I know you know many people have um, have tried sociocracy and not necessarily understood it well enough. They haven't really uh, gotten a, a good enough handle on how it works, and therefore it's created problems and tensions. And many people say, "Yeah, but sociocracy, nice idea, it just doesn't work," um, and which is why. I've actually reinvented sociocracy to work in a in a way that um, that really can uh, we can really hit the ground running and really make projects really happen fast. So, for example, when I run a permaculture design course, which typically I do over sixteen days, 
So you have 20 odd people from all different backgrounds and, you know, different walks of life, different mentalities, all coming together to live together, to eat together, to sleep together and so on and so forth and learn together and share each share experiences. Uh, I do it without any rules to start off with. And I say the first day is all about us finding and co-creating those rules. Now, you know, what are our boundaries of co-creating a common vision? So I teach sociocracy. And as I say, yeah, and I'm really blessed because of the way in which I work um, and how I make my courses really affordable. You know, I, I don't have a fixed price. I just say offer what you genuinely feel you can offer, what you think is um, affordable to you but that you also realize is fair to me as a person, because this is my livelihood. And so because of this real flexibility and okay, and if you need to pay me in 10 installments over 10 months, fine. You know, if you want to pay me with, I don't know, um, you know, doing, do, I don't know, taking care of my dreadlocks or something, you know, whatever it is, if you don't have cash, what else is it that you can offer? So there's some fair exchange. And because of this, I have, such a wide variety of people coming on my course i have a lot and because of my color you know especially in europe where what we realize is a lot of people yeah i can take some olive oil thank you very much uh so um so yeah so um i have such a wide variety of people coming from you know from 16 year olds who have just left school without any qualifications and no interest in really studying to university, retired university professors, you know, uh, male, female, LGBTQ, transgender. I have such an amazing array of people, different colors, you know, different uh, backgrounds. And it's really beautiful. But, you know, many of these people may not have met people like that before, you know, let alone having to somehow relate to them and become friends. And so I say, so we start with no, um, no, no rules. And I start off by saying, right, the first thing we need to know is uh, what are the things that uh, if this happens is really going to interfere with your ability to really thrive and to make your heart sing while you're here. So that could be something around food allergies. It could be something around I don't know, certain trigger points. It could be. So we ask everyone about all those kind of things. And and then right now, what are the things once we've addressed those and looked at all of those and expressed them? Now, what are the things that if we do is really going to make your heart sing? What are the things that if this happens while you're here, you're just, wow, I love these people. The, the, this is my, these are my, this is my family. But real, you know, real. So what are the things that we need to do? So we slowly co-create these rules, these guidances. We do it all in a sociocratic way. So everyone has an opportunity to express themselves one by one, you know, with a talking stick. Everyone shares their dream. Everyone shares their challenges. We then formulate ideas and proposals. We co-create a vision. We co-create a mission. How is it we're going to deliver the mission? And then we start looking at the aims. What are the actual deliverables? So we need to eat together. So how are we going? Where are we going to get the food from? How are we going to cook? How are we going to pay for the food? What kind of quality of food is it? Is it all organic? Is it better to have it organic? Is it better imported from halfway around the world, or is it better to have food that is local but is full of pesticides? Uh, you know, and we co-create to try and work out. Well, what is it that is right for us you know and um and but knowing a really important pattern who's heard of the forming storming norming performing pattern is that familiar forming storming norming performing all right this is a really important common pattern that happens with people um is when we first come together we assume that, well, all right, another way to put it, uh, we're pack animals. As human beings, we are, a, we have, for millions of years, we've evolved as a pack animal. What that means is that 
we want to come together in groups because there's safety, there's protection as being part of the group. And so our primordial mind is to come together and, and work together and be together. Uh, it's a culture and the cultures around the world that teach us that we are individual and we are separate and we must compete against each other and all the rest of it. That's a cultural learning. Um, it's not what who we it's not our primordial mind. It's not where we actually come from. We're a pack animal. So when we join a new pack and we don't know enough about the pack, we need to work out what is our place? Who is this pack? What is what is uh, acceptable? What is not acceptable in this pack? How do I remain safe? How do I know that I am safe here? So when you first present yourself to a group, you present a, a what you believe the group wants to hear. You put on a mask and hey, look at me, aren't I good looking and I'm really helpful and I'm really super fantastic and you know, and you should all love me because I am amazing. And you put on this mask and, um, and it takes a lot of effort to keep that mask on. But as you start to get to know each other, but are you really getting to know each other? Or are you getting to know the masked versions? of the other people but you start to get to you know figure things out figure and then you start to um start to drop the mask and and all of a sudden you start revealing your true self and in a in a really intensive course that, that i do you know the 16 day courses uh this typically happens around day four or five and people start taking the mask off and start revealing themselves and it's like in a relationship, this is the moment where, for example, your partner farts in bed for the first time. And it's like, oh, oh, OK, if, if they can fart in bed, does that mean I can as well? You know, and now we're starting to, OK, this is the reality. Actually, you know, when I eat this kind of food, then, yeah, I, I'm full of gas and it's got to come out at some point. So, hey, this is the real me, you know, Um and so, um, so basically, you, um, yeah. If we think about it, this moment is actually the most pre is the most beautiful moment in a friendship, in a relationship, in a community, because what it's saying is, hey, I trust you enough now to show you my real self. I can show you who I really am. And in showing your real self, if that real self compared to who you presented yourself as being was so different, then quite often this is where tension comes in. And this is where the clash happens. This is where projects often fall apart, relationships fall apart because of that difference. And, well, you were lying to me. You said this, but really you're that. What's going on? No, 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 I can't trust you. And um, but actually, if we really look at it and if we learn how to deal with that, well, what we see is this is the moment where we can really transform. So if we can now learn to fall in love with that person, so we recognize that, hey, that was the masked view. That was the masked version of you who originally said that and originally said, you know, this is what you're into. This is who you were. But now I really want to get to know the real you. And when we come together in this way, then we can really perform. So going back to the beginning of, uh, you know, what we were saying about how when we come together and F ask everyone to express themselves and create a vision. This first vision is based on the masked version of ourselves. And people have expressed themselves as if, you know, coming from that perspective. Oh, yeah. Vegan eco village, even though I don't eat even though I eat meat and chicken and, you know, and cheese and stuff. But yeah, I'll say that I'm vegan just to be part of the group. And then later on, it expires that, you know, it transpires that actually, no, you're not. And so, um, so yeah, so the, uh, once we're getting to this point and now we start to express ourselves again, you know, now what we need to do is we now need to co-create a new vision based on who we really are. And at this point, 
this is the real magic. This is where things can really begin to go. So we need a governance structure that allows us to create a temporary vision, allows us to get to know each other, and then allows us to change that vision. So the way that I do this very often in my most of my projects and, and what have you is we we share that common vision initially, you know, the masked version of ourselves. Obviously, I, I then give them tools for how to get to know each other, to get to trust each other, to um, start expressing ourselves and encourage everyone to express themselves as clearly as they possibly can, uh, given the level of trust that they have at this particular moment, knowing that um, that that will change you know but that, that may not be the trust may not be there at the beginning so that's fine but we try and do as much as we can initially then uh instead of actually starting the real project instead of going and buying the land if instead what we do is we do some kind of a project that really in, means that we really have to do some work really closely together to deliver uh, and quite often I'll do like a festival, for example, organize an event, a really complex event uh, where everyone has to show up and everyone has to show their skills and be really fully involved in it. And and then once we've delivered that event, what's happened is, is you know, we've spent plenty of time. We've done something today together. We've achieved something together. We have some kind of come, but what we've most importantly done is we've got to learn about each other. We've got to understand who is who. What are your real skills? What are the things you are really passionate about? So it may come to to pass that, um, wow, I saw, you know, when when you first expressed yourself, you said you were really passionate about this, but I saw when you started to do that, oh, um, wow, I saw your eyes light up. I saw that that really made your heart sing. And that was your real passion, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's amazing. Of course, we can use that in our project. Why didn't you tell us that you were passionate about that before? This is brilliant. And so now, having got to know, you know, and yeah, you said you were, you know, really good at, you know, really passionate about, you know, doing accounts and things. But you're not really, are you? You were you're just because you saw we needed someone to do the finances. So... But I can see that's not your really your strong point. Um, so in this way, you know, we can really get to know who's who. We can get to understand how we express ourselves and how, you know, and we, we can start to build trust amongst each other. And now we can co-create a vision again. And now we can co-create a vision of how we really moved forward together. So, yeah, so that common vision um building trust achieving things together uh these are really important components of any community uh beyond that we've also got um so yeah so, so if we kind of extrapolate that uh first of all having a common vision that we can change as we evolve and as we grow and as we get to trust each other then having all kinds of practices all kinds of team building practices so you know and this can come through a culture this can come through actual actions so for example eating together cooking together eating together singing together playing together um expressing ourselves you know uh expressing our challenges our fears you know really deeply getting to know each other you know that doesn't happen overnight but that le depth of level when we get to that point where we really are starting to share some of the things that really trigger us you know with a view to knowing that if i share this with you as a group i know you will take it um you'll respond in a way that actually is really rich for me meaning uh, you will hear me, you will not judge me for it, and you will support me in trying to understand my trigger point to see uh, whether, you know, uh, I can, how I can resolve that. Is it that the community needs to do something? You know, it's it's like a, a non-change, but it's like I'm allergic to something. 
in which case, if you expose me to this, I might die, in which case that's non-changeable. But, but if it's an emotional thing that I've learned that I can change to know that you will help me and support me to, you know, not be triggered by those things. Um, you know, how do we find the pattern by which we can figure out, you know, the, the best route to stop me from being triggered? Um, so as I say, those things, they come later on, uh, but we need to have those practices. You know, we need all kinds of different team building opportunities. And as I say, working together, achieving things together, um, you know, having, I don't know, different rituals, like a morning ritual, uh, an evening ritual, a, a meal ritual, whatever. Things that kind of give us a kind of common feeling that, yeah, we're really moving together. These things are really important. Um, and then communication is another area. So maybe what I'll do is maybe I'll I'll talk for maybe another five minutes and then, um, yeah, leave a little space for, for questions and answers because I, I realise I've spoken a lot already. Um, and I can probably talk for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours more because um, this is my real strong passion. And there's so much that we can do in this area. Um, so, yes, yeah, so having uh clear communications and processes is also really valuable so when uh, a new person comes into the project what's your induction process how is it that you welcome them in to the project what are the things you do you know you are you going to bombard them with your whole google drive and you know this form here that form that and, and blow their minds and there's they get them to run away or how is it you smooth them in so they really get to understand where you're, you know, where you're coming from, what you're doing, how you're doing it, what your practices are. What is that process? When someone leaves the project, how is it that you celebrate all the amazing things that that person has done during your project to say, wow, thank you so much. It was such a beautiful pleasure to have you part of this community we wish you all the love and you know in your future journey uh, how is it we hand on information and knowledge i mean maybe maybe they're they're you know they were holding certain knowledge that was really crucial and really critical to your project how do we make sure that's passed on you know for sure uh, this is something that is really essential is uh, is to always ensure that there's several people who are holding all knowledge of the project and you don't have specialists who only that person knows how to fix the boiler and when the boiler breaks if that person's not here we're all going to freeze that's not good enough um you know and so yeah so so whatever you're doing is how do you skill each other how do you skill each other how do you you know um and dragon dreaming has some really beautiful ways around this where uh to really identify you know things where people have real strong passion uh and there's a difference between passion and knowledge so for example i can make websites and build computer systems but i'm really not passionate to do that you know for me to sit behind a computer and i have a choice do i sit behind a computer for two months building a website for someone or do I go outside plant trees and interact with bees and insects and nature uh no question I'm outside I'm with nature there's no way I'm going to be in front of a computer so while I may be able to do it it's not necessarily my passion it's not really going to make my heart sing so whereas if it's necessary for a project for me to bring these skills in you know I'd be much you know what through dragon dreaming that we can identify is other people perhaps who uh would love to know how to build a website uh but maybe don't have the skills yet so could i teach them could i support them and be the backup to that person so huh, i don't need to do it but i'm there if you need me and so i can go outside and interact with the bees and the insects and slugs and all the rest of it um and so yeah so having these uh, common you know these practices these communications these uh um yeah different processes of how we do things and 
again, the way in which we can come to these, again, is by using things like sociocracy, because sociocracy, as I say, is a whole series of rules that we co-create of how we can really work well together, of, of things that are really going to allow us to make our hearts sing, so that we're in a space where we can share our ideas, we can share, um, you know, share our knowledge, share... Um, you know, share things in such a way that we really all beautifully move together. Um, I think the last thing that I'll say before we take, uh, yeah, before I invite questions is, um, is around all the legal stuff. Uh, people are really happy to go and dig and, you know, and grow food and, um, you know, do all the, the real fun stuff, you know, build houses and all that kind of really amazing stuff and make electricity and blah, 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 blah. But you also need to make sure that all your legal responsibilities are also well held, you know, that you're doing your tax returns, your accounts, your uh, that you have all the legal side really well managed. Uh, because if you don't have that, Again, that creates tension. And, you know, there's one particular project that I that reached out to me because they were in real trouble. And that was basically their their challenge. And before I actually um, managed to get in front of them, I actually talked to them, you know, over the two months that we were talking and trying to organize a date, they completely imploded completely, totally imploded because of legal reasons, because of because there wasn't someone passionate enough to do the legal work properly. They'd done a few things in a rather unsavory way, shall we say, in an incomplete way, which created huge legal repercussions. And uh, and that pretty much destroyed the project. So, um, yeah, so, to, so if there is an accountant who really loves doing your paperwork, look after them really 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 keep asking them, what can i do to really make your heart sing because these are really you know if there's someone who's good at even writing funding bids or whatever it might be these are really important you know these are not that anyone's more important than another but these ones really need a little bit of extra special care because they're the ones willing to do the stuff that most of us just really wouldn't want to ever be doing so um OK, that's enough of a, a general kind of, you know, again, there's so much detail I can fill in. Um, but as I say, for me, the, 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 the sociocracy really holds the key. So if there's one thing I would really encourage you to deeply look into in a in a rich way. And as I say, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of material out there and there's a lot of people doing sociocracy, in not necessarily the best possible way. But uh, but if you ignore some of the superficial stuff and really delve deep into what sociocracy is and how it actually really works you'll see that it really is amazing so yeah so questions and i'm really really i'm dyslexic so i really i'm a little bit slow to to read stuff but i'll i'll see if i can also start catching up with if there's any messages in there but i see julie has a hand up go for it first of all Mega thank you. That was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if you can give some guidelines, and it doesn't have to be here, but somewhere some guidelines for some really good uh, sociocracy people around New York. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know if you have a list somewhere. We would love, we have a community of 70 people. Uh, I think so much of what you covered is is what we need and i would i would really prefer if this person could do face to face with us rather than it being zoom otherwise obviously i would ask you to do it with us but if you have any recommendations of people who you think are not just going to do the tool stuff because i've had that and i know the difference exactly of what you're talking about so maybe Where did you say you say New York, New York. Uh huh. Okay. For some reason, I thought you were 
from down under. Um, I am from down under, but I'm in a community at the moment in New York for a couple of years working here with them. So I can find out there is sociocracy for all who have um, nice trainings. Uh, I don't know where they're based. Uh, for me, I've never had a desire to go to Abhi Ayala, um, which I'm sure many of you are aware is the decolonialized name for what the colonialists call America. Um, I've never had a desire to go to go there, so I've never been. And it's one big blob on the other side. Um, so I don't really know. You know, I don't know the geography. I don't know who's doing what, where. But um, I can find out for you. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Or was there another okay. question? Or was it just a recommendation? There's, there's heaps, but I'm going to leave space for others and I'll come back. So you're more than welcome. I, I can leave some of my details. You know, you're more than welcome to ask questions. And I do online trainings as well. So and support and anyone who studies with me uh, joins this network, the Roots and Permaculture Learning Community. And so we have regular uh, monthly sessions where we do skillshare so once you've finished the training course that's not over that's just the beginning so then these regular skill shares uh, are where you can come in and say right we've been trying to do this sociocratically and we're coming to this problem can anyone help us and so on and so forth so yes yeah, so you're more than welcome I'm, I'm happy to do online trainings as well rosamond Hey, how are you? Yeah, sure, good, thanks. Um, yeah, we met in London at a biochar workshop that you did, so just hi again. Um, yeah, a question, you mentioned um, that you'd change something when you're practicing with the sociocracy model. There was something that you changed, but I didn't quite get what, like, could you sum up what the, is it something you've changed about the, the, okay. the process or a thing you've added? Or I don't know if it's possible to sum up or if I just missed it and you said it already. I didn't say it. Um, as you could probably tell, I didn't plan any of this talk. It just whatever came out was what came out when it wanted to come out. So, um, so yeah. So if it was a little bit unstructured, it's, it's this is just how I am. Um, so yeah. So what is absolutely non-changeable, as far as I'm concerned, in sociocracy, is uh, it's a flat structure that allows that uh, prevents anyone, from, one person from having more power than anybody else. So it's a flat structure where what we have, instead of having a hierarchy of people, we have a hierarchy of processes. So how does communication move through the system to be clear, to be effective? Um, so that uh, because one of the most important things in it is if an individual is affected by a decision, that person must be given the opportunity to be part of the decision making process. If something affects you, you must be able to affect the decision. Uh, it's your choice if you choose not to, but you must be given that opportunity. And, um, and all decisions are made by consent. And what uh, what that means is what you're instead of trying to find the perfect solution. What you're looking to do is you're looking to find the highest common denominator, you know where the end goal is, you know what the vision is. And rather than uh, trying to find the perfect way that you all say, yeah, this is the perfect way, which let's face it is impossible because we're all different, we all have different experiences. So there's no way we're all gonna be able to say the perfect way to achieve something. But what we find is what is that highest common denominator that says, if we do this, we will end up going in the direction that we want to go. So we're looking for a, a solution that is good enough for now, that is safe enough to try. In other words, it's good enough for now, it's gonna help us on the in the right direction, and there's no nothing that any of us can see that will compromise our ability to get to our end goal or, you know, or create tension within us or do something that is immoral or whatever, whatever. So that's the absolute core. Where I differ is that in what you see in a lot of sociocratic projects is that you, you start with a big 
you know, you have like a, a, a main core circle and then lots and lots and lots of sub circles. And when you all meet, you know, you discuss everything in that big meeting. So I have this tension and in order to resolve this tension, I need to express this and then people feed back on that and, you know, give some more ideas and possible solutions. And, you know, and you you basically have a conversation and you discuss and, you know, and um, and, and that can take a long time. It takes as long as it needs uh, until you get to the point where you all say, ah, yes, now. Great. Now we can test for consent. Does anyone see any reason if this proposal that we've just co-created, can anyone see any reason as to why if we accept this, it will prevent us from getting our vision, from moving towards our vision or is against the culture that we've created? So say that takes time. Now, if you imagine if you're in a meeting where you have five or six points that need to be discussed and, um, you know, and there's 20 people there and you you're basically interested in two of them. You know, maybe for two hours of that meeting, you are bored. And this doesn't create richness. This doesn't make you say, yeah, I want to go to that meeting. Oh, yeah, this is I love these meetings. I love... It's like, oh, my God, do I really have to sit through all of that? Um so this is the part that I've changed. I've changed it. So when we have a group meeting where everyone is together, um, and this is as far as I know is still unique. There's not many, no one else is teaching sociocracy this way. Uh, but when that group comes together, it's first of all, it's only once every three months. So it's not regular. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not so often, uh, but effectively in order to make all the decisions we have to do all the work before the meeting so when we're at the meeting the actual five decisions can all be made within half an hour so because first of all before the meeting we say right we've got this tension uh who is interested in helping to resolve this tension and whoever has the energy the passion the knowledge the skills uh to be part of that proposal forming group has their meeting they then put the, meet the proposal together they share it with everyone everyone looks it everyone reads it and if people are okay with it and they understand it they don't need to respond but if they don't understand they hey can you explain that to me we organize a meeting so people get clarification if for some reason it gets adjusted it gets tweaked then again we need to make sure uh, that it's expressed to everyone by the way we've now changed the proposal it's now this so we go through that loop again so by the time you get to the meeting everyone is clear on what the proposal is and some people haven't read it at all but you know what that's a finance thing you guys are good with finance I trust that you know what you're talking about when it comes to finance I don't need to tell you anything I, I don't need to participate I just trust you and so I have no reason to object to it. And so these are the little things. I make sure that my meetings and now when we have this three month meeting, once every three months meeting, we have fun. We connect to each other. We have a little social. We get to know about each other. We share all the amazing things we've done together. We share some of the challenges that we've had, how we've overcome them. We uh, share, you know, we, we, we basically we have fun together. We enjoy being with each other and we remind each other why we're in this project. You know, why we, we really love being together. So this is this is my tweak uh, in a short period as I can. Cool. So, Diego, I see you have your hand up. And again, maybe one or two more questions and then we'll start bringing it to an end. Diego, Oop, did you just disappear? Or was that hand from before? No, no, no. I I just wanted to ask if you've tried the system of nonviolent communication and what you think of it and how it intersects with sociocracy. So there's a lot of people who really uh, really trust nonviolent communication and think it really is an essential tool that bolts onto sociocracy really well. Um, being dyslexic and a little bit 
illiterate, shall we say. I struggle to read and write. I don't understand language. I don't understand the roots of language. I don't understand the roots of words. I, uh, uh, I find nonviolent communication to be too prescriptive and requires people to really understand language really so well. It's beyond me. So I really struggle with nonviolent communication. Um, I've also had lots of bad experiences of where people have been imposing nonviolent communication on me. You know, uh, what do you need? I need a drink of water. Can I have some water, please? Yes, but what is your real need? Uh, thirst? I'm kind of thirsty. Can I have something to drink, please? Yes, but what is really behind that thirst? I just want a fucking glass of water. What's fucking wrong with you? Just, you know, ah! And, um, you know, and really manipulated. Uh, I, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm, actually, that was a real, real, real example. But I've had other cases where um, I really have felt really manipulated by people using very clever words at the right time to try and twist things and to make me say things that I don't genuinely believe in or want. And I've, it's because I don't understand language well enough. Um, so what it does do though for me is uh, as a basic structure, I can see there's many things. I can see when I've said something that has upset somebody, I can really quickly notice that because of having looked at these tools and understood the tools. And I can see, ah, oh, yeah, I've upset someone because they've assumed when I said this, they've assumed that. So I need to be much more clear. So let me reframe myself. Let me take a step back and uh, apologize. And, you know, and so uh, I would say it was valuable for me to have learned some of it. But I find it very, 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 very difficult to implement uh, because of my illiteracy, shall we say, because I'm not uh, someone who really understands language well enough. Um, I've also had, if I can tell one last little story, I was running, um, we organised the London Permaculture Festival uh, the first year and I totally burnt out the first year because we were really mad how we organized it the second year my father passed away so i couldn't be involved in the organizing but i just turned up at the last minute and on the day and said just give me a task to do on the day they said great right here's a hall we've got uh 80 stall holders uh you need to organize the you know where all the tables go and you've got two hours because people start coming in two hours people started coming in in 15 minutes and what I realized is the number of stalls people wanted, tables people wanted, compared to how many we had, I think we had something like um, 50 and they they needed something like 80. And uh, it was just not possible. So everyone, I was just, all right, bang, bang, bang. Okay, there you go there. All right, what well, brilliant. Can you do, oh, could you do it like Indian style where you can put all your stuff on the floor and, you know, be like, well, okay, great. Well, okay, there you go. Say four tables there. Do you know? And bing, bang, and everyone was really, and then the nonviolent communication guy came along, said, I want two tables. I said, sorry, but you've only got one listed on your thing. And I'm already, you know, I'm still 10 tables short. I don't have enough to even give you that one. Uh, but all I can do is, but I insist, and he was really violent with me, that you have to give me two tables. I'm, I'm sorry, but I cannot give you that, you know. And uh, and after two minutes, I said, you know what? Just fuck off. Get out of here. Like everyone else is being nice and polite. You are being really aggressive. And I'm sorry, you cannot get two tables from me because I don't have two tables to give you. And with no, just go away. Go away. Next, 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 next. And literally, I just ignored him for the next until eventually he accepted uh, one table. And so, yeah, my <laughs> my experience with nonviolent communication is very mixed, should we say. I've got a few other experiences in India where someone came to do nonviolent communication on our workshop and oh my God, she didn't know what she was doing and she created so much tension that she was supposed to do two sessions and all the students said, if you dare bring her back, we are walking out. So I've had some really, 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 really unusual, shall we say, experiences. And I'm not saying that's that's the case for everyone. I understand where it's coming from, 
Um, I just struggle with it personally. Um, but if it works for you, good for you. If you can, you know, if you're in a community that can really make it work, I think it has a huge potential, but I think it really needs, um, it really needs softening to make it more acceptable to not just the intellectual crowd, to, to, to make it more accessible to just, yeah, ordinary folk like me. So, Great. I see Melissa has her hand up as well. And Hi. sorry if I swear a little bit, but, you know, I'm from East London, so, you know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, good. Sorry, <laughs> um, hopefully it's a, it's okay if you can't answer. I don't know how much time there is. Um, I was just uh, curious about um, um, the 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 process of the in between the three months um, that you said where you settle um, uh, disagreements. Uh, if it's easy to give an example, um, I'm not sure if that makes sense. That question. Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand. Can you say it again? So where in the three months you mean be between um you know how you're saying you, you meet every three months maybe um and have fun and okay. then in between yeah kind of what that process is yeah. in between uh just like a, an example does that make sense? Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So what are the processes that happen between those three meet that in between those policy? OK, so what what we really need to understand with sociocracy is where it really works well is around uh, policy meetings, policy decisions, as opposed to operational decisions. So operational decisions are like uh, who's going to go and pick the carrots today? Someone needs to go and clean the toilet. Who's going to do that? You know, these are day to day operational things. Yeah, who's going to write this document? Who's going to, you know, apply for the funding? Who's going to, you know, do the tax return? Well, these are, you know, operational things. Whereas what kind of food do we grow? This is policy. So we grow food that is organic. And so the once we've got good policies together, uh, they don't necessarily need to change so often. So maybe initially when you're first putting the project together, maybe you have the sociocratic policy meetings once a month until you've got a good group of, of policies that you feel, yeah, we can really run with these. And then that's where you go to the three month pattern. In between there, <clears throat> to make operational decisions, you have lots of operational groups making that, you know, having their meetings in whatever way. And if sociopsy works for that group to make those decisions go for it if it doesn't work for you if it's a hindrance to you it's the wrong tool you're using the wrong it's a good tool but used in the wrong place so you don't need it so if you have a better way of doing it for operational decisions go for it but if sociopsy works fantastic but what i do uh, so each operational group has their way of, of doing things but if there is something that is coming up in your group and you know it affects someone else, you need to share that with someone. And uh, and so, you know, if you as a, um, a food growing group, for example, or as an events group want to organize something, you know, you're going to have to involve the, the finance team as well as maybe the food growing team, as well as the maybe the building management team or whatever. So you need some way to express that and pass that information through so you can build the pro the the project that you're trying to do um, in a good way. So what we have is we have once a week, what I call a, a kind of, you know, if anyone understands a bit about um, Scrum or Agile, we have what we call stand-up meetings. Uh, I borrow the term from there. Um, my background, I used to be an IT consultant. So I've got a very logical, very organized kind of way of doing things. And so, um, so during the stand-up meeting, it's half an hour and each group feeds back on what's going really well in their project. So where are you at with your project? But what are the things you're also stuck with? And what help do you need? Now, you don't then go and have a discussion and a debate about it. You just flag it up. This is a challenge. This is an issue. This is the help that I need. And maybe someone could say, yeah, 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 I can help you with that. All right, let's talk afterwards. So it just gets flagged up. It gets, you know, uh, we get to be become aware of what's going on in the whole ecosystem. Um, 
so so yes yeah, so we know what each other all the other groups are doing uh but we don't end up having debates and discussions during that meeting it just gets flagged up and then you have that discussion in your own time in your own place whenever it's appropriate um yeah so so a lot of the the, the stuff or a lot of the meetings happen with whoever has the energy whoever is interested whoever has the time uh whoever it affects should all be invited but only people who who really as say have the time the energy and the the knowledge to to go to that meeting are the ones who go there and um and so yes yeah, so so those are the meetings that do happen then you've got all kinds of other procedural things that need to happen like electing people into roles you know you need a facilitator you need someone to to make sure all of the the policies are recorded and are made available you need people to organize meetings and then you need if you uh, uh, create your group into into sub groups which again that's another story as to how i get there i have a, a very different approach um that's also a pattern that doesn't work for many groups but uh, i can explain that another time if people are really interested but let's say you are at the stage where you now do have lots of sub groups you know different working groups and things uh, you need a way in which they communicate so you need to elect someone to be um, the vision upholder for the subgroup and then you need um, you know and that way it kind of looks really top down because from the central group you've elected someone to be the the you know in the old sociocratic terms they call it the the operations leader I prefer to call it the vision upholder uh, and that's one way that's that kind of top down that way if we leave it like that so instead in order to make it sociocratic each sub circle or working group which is a better term elect someone to represent them back at the main circle again so you have a two-way you know there's always two people from each group one who makes sure that whatever comes from the main circle is being done in the working group you know that the working group if you say that the food growing group should grow food organically they make sure that the food is being grown organically they're just upkeeping the vision ensuring the group does what it's uh in, been invited to do but vice versa the someone from that group sits in the main circle to make sure anything that anyone else is doing is doing it in a way that takes care of and resonates with and is in sync with the food growing group so that, that that's the kind of circle structure so you need to have different meetings to elect people into those roles and to do role reviews and the role reviews are really amazing really beautiful because it's all about what's happening that um you know this is the role description that we created for you this is what you say you're doing really well and this is what we think you're doing well uh these are things that you think you're not doing so well uh, these are things we think you're not doing so well how do we now support you to actually do the task that you've been invited to do or is it that the role description that we've created isn't actually really accurate and you find that actually this is even more beautiful what I'm doing compared to what you thought I should be doing so in other words we support each other in uh, we support someone in a role to to, to become better and to evolve the role so all these kind of meetings are, are things that happen in between the three-month meetings and there's a lot more i have um as i say just pure social meetings just to get to know each other we have heart and circle meetings where you know people can just express you know things that are making their hearts sing we have um yeah all kinds of different yeah all kinds of different uh, meetings but for a purpose you know and again only people who have time energy and a passion to be there are the ones that are there thank you you're welcome so i've shared a, a link to my campsite from there you can find my i think you should find my email you'll find lots of videos i'm really rubbish when it comes to social media but there's some stuff out there there's a few videos out there on my youtube I, I'm starting to try and learn how Instagram works begrudgingly. Um, Facebook is where I have probably a lot of my, you know, a lot of my workshops are out there. Um, I have a little radio, I don't know, we should be calling it a podcast these days. 
Uh, so I have a podcast explaining permaculture through reggae. Reggae is my my real passion. Um, so explaining permaculture through reggae. There's a whole podcast around that. There's a little interview explaining who I am, where I come from, and my background and stuff. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. You're more than welcome to go through. And also my website, which has resources. If once you do the sociocracy course, you'll understand all the resources that I put for sociocracy on there are all um yeah it will it will make sense as to as to you know what that information yeah what the stuff is so it's got log books you know uh it's got log books it's got uh role descriptions for different roles and all that kind of stuff so you're more than welcome all of it's open source feel free to take it creative commons reuse it rebadge it just keep the creative commons but anyway Thank you all very much for coming. I think there's another session on children and how to engage children in permaculture. How do we, um, as well as doing children in permaculture, the next project I'm going to revive again is looking at how to engage youths in permaculture. So how do we give young people a platform uh, to experiment, to try, to test, to really get to know permaculture? Um yeah, to really get to know permaculture so that by the time they go off into whatever vocations they may choose, they go into it with this real strength of knowing that they can bring earth care, people care, fair share into the world in whatever realm they want to do. So we're looking at starting to create projects around that. OK, thank you all very much. Lots of love, big hugs. Feel free to unmute and say goodbye in whatever language feels right for you. Thank you, Rakesh. Gracias. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Lots of love, everyone. See you around. Have fun.